group, please say your salams. You're all here today again, mashallah. Yesterday, your Baba couldn't join us. Well, I'm glad Baba is back and joining us today. Uh, that's a blessing to have you here. And thank you so much for your consistency. It's lovely to see it, mashallah. Tahmeed as well, of course, one of our OGs. Akram, welcome as well. And let's see where everybody else is coming in from. Um, it's so hard to keep up with, mashallah, our amazing YouTube squad. Oh, hold on. And this is when I say I have to remember to mute stuff. Okay, alhamdulillah. Let's see you YouTubers uh, coming in live with us and then on Facebook as well. Welcome, especially if you're coming in for more than your first session. If you've been here for the past couple of days of Al Maghrib Family First, shout yourselves out. And if you're uh, hijacking again your parents' accounts or your younger viewer, I definitely want to hear your name. Uh, and inshallah, as I read them, I will shout you guys out uh, in the chat uh, and I'll shout you guys out while we're live, inshallah. So it's four o'clock. We're starting in just five minutes with our first speaker, Sheikh Omar Hadrouj. Uh, but inshallah, beforehand, I want to warm up and make sure that all of you are here. You have your coffees, your cocos, uh, and everyone's there at the couch, inshallah, joining you for today's session. And the topic, of course, for today's session is going to be light. And I have a guest. This is my family member who cannot stop joining us whenever we have a live session. Assalamu alaikum, Mahar. Say salam to everybody. And now go. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullah. Kara and family from Virginia. Vazira, wa alaikum as wa rahmatullah. Aisha, your six year old from Calgary, mashallah, stealing your mom's uh, account, I see, mashallah. And then who else do we have? We have Narima, Adnan, Rabia, Mahmouda. Uh, oh, mashallah. I mean, you're from Connecticut and you're nine. Welcome. Uh, Jazakallah khair for joining us again. I mean, have you been to all of the sessions that we've had so far for Family First? And how have you been enjoying them so far? Um, Lubna as well. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullah. Layla. Um, it's a pleasure to see some familiar faces or some familiar names, alhamdulillah, so far. Um, and I'm glad to see that a lot of people are coming in again for their second and third times, alhamdulillah. I still haven't caught my friends on YouTube. So let me find you guys first. Oh, there we are. Alrighty. Asma, MK. Oh, MK, I'm getting familiar with your name. Kias, uh, AFK, Omar, Madiha. Madiha, I remember you as well. Uh, Reyes, Abiyu, Jazakallah Khair, Zaria. Your, Maryam is from London, age five. Welcome, Maryam. Maryam, did you type in or type that in or was it your parents? Um, and AJ from Oldham, UK. Hopefully if I said that correctly. Akhtar, Ridwana, I see you. <laughs> I have not forgotten you. <laughs> Jawad is three from Calgary. Jawad, I hope that you, you don't know how to type at three. Masha'Allah. Asia, who's four, and your family from Ashburn, Virginia. Masha'Allah. Wow, there's so many of you. It's such a pleasure to have you back. We're so excited to kick off day three of Family First. And of course, uh, this is one of our exciting series that's just a tiny little taste of uh, some of the exciting things that Al-Maghrib has coming up for 2021 and our biggest project ever, which is, of course, Al-Maghrib Kids. So for the parents who are listening, who are uh, trying to get their devices back from their kids, uh, Alhamdulillah, this has been uh, the biggest dream, I think, of the institution to expand. And we have my family member once again to expand uh, the Al-Maghrib projects to include children, because that's the most important way. Uh, to inspire love and to continue the work uh, of our deen going forward. And alhamdulillah, a lot of, uh, of course, our courses are amazing for adults and for families uh, and for, you know, mature individuals, but it's important to translate that and make it accessible and make it fun and make it exciting for children. So I do encourage you guys to check out the description box, inshallah. Uh, you'll be able to see uh, a little link and there's an easier way to reach it as well. You can just go to almagrib.org slash kids and you'll see this little uh, URL that'll lead you to the launch good campaign that we have for Amal Group Kids, an exciting new project. I want you guys to be involved in the very beginning of it uh, as we're kind of developing and building up uh, to get to the goal of inshallah having a full-fledged program for kids uh, coming up in the next couple of years. Please uh, engage in the khair and uh, share as far and wide inshallah this campaign is going to be closing very soon and I want to make sure that you guys can get involved at this stage inshallah. Now, I won't take too much more of your time. Just remember that URL, almagrib.org slash kids. Uh, you can save it and have it open uh, on the side as well. There's a lot more information on that page as well, uh, inshallah. So if you have questions, you're welcome to uh, check that out or put them in the chat and I'd love to answer them for you. Um, but without further ado, I don't want to take too much more time because I know we have an exciting session and a talk coming up with uh, Sheikh Omar Hadruj on the topic of light from darkness, finding hope from the story of Ikrimah, the son of Abu Jahl. Um, so Sheikh Omar, I know I've been 
uh, taking the spotlight for a bit. I'd love to see you on. And in the meantime, I'm just going to check the chats for all the lovely people who've joined us since we've started. Um, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Shay, how are you doing? Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Good to see you again, Sister Hafsa. Alhamdulillah. Awesome sauce. Good to hear. Um, what did you, what was the reason that you picked this topic in general or in specifically? Uh, so the, the stories of the companions in general are always beautiful. They always give us like this beautiful uh, image or picture of the Prophet ﷺ from so many different perspectives. You know, like you guys saw yesterday with Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu an. And so uh, Ikrimah's story also you get that. And then you also get this immense uh, sense of, of hope uh, from his story. And, and he's someone that, you know, not a lot of people maybe know his, the details of his story. So, so my goal was to kind of bring him more to the forefront. And I've never ever met a, a Ikrima, like a person named Ikrima. So the goal is hopefully at the end of this story, people will be inspired. You know, if you have a child, a son, to name your to name your son Ikrima as well. So that's that's that was one of the goals there also. That's a beautiful point. That's so interesting. I don't think I was just scratching my head right now. I don't think I have. If there is an Ikrima uh, in attendance, please shout out. I see a lot of Muhammads and Ibrahims and Akhtars and Suads and Hatikas. But if there is an Ikrima, I'm so curious now. Um, but uh, I'm excited for the story. Inshallah, we have 30 minutes uh, to delve into the story of Ikrima, the son of uh, Abu Jahl, inshallah. And then if you have questions that come to mind, make sure you save them and you put them in the chat at the end. And we'll ask Sheikh Omar. Uh, okay, Bismillah, Sheikh. I'm going to pass it off to you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala khairi khalqillah nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa ala. It's good to be back with the Al Maghrib family uh, for another session in this Al Maghrib family, the story time that we're having. We say alhamdulillah, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the blessing of family. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we say alhamdulillah for these opportunities to come together, even though we're so separate or so far away physically, to be able to come together in this way is a huge blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we say alhamdulillah, thumma alhamdulillah, the ultimate level of alhamdulillah for the blessing of Islam. The greatest blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has gifted us, the thing that has allowed for us to see lights after maybe times of darkness, or to at least be in the light and never to have experienced that darkness. And so the, one of the reasons also that I chose this particular story is because of kind of what everyone at this point uh, in time in our world is looking for, right? That we constantly hear negative news or we're constantly being made aware of you know something negative or something bad happening in this part of the world or that part of the world or it seems like things maybe are going into more and more of a pessimistic or a darker state and so one thing that especially in a time of a pandemic where there is a lot of darkness where we're seeing maybe even close people that we know maybe even loved ones people that sat with us at this time last year that are no longer with us. So all of us are looking in one shape or in one form or another for hope. And you know, one of the beautiful things about Islam is that I would consider one of its hallmark qualities or themes or principles to be hope. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us through this tradition, through this faith, so many opportunities for hope and so many directions to look in to find hope. Not just in theory, right? Not just in theory, like there's always hope and we talk about and we say this word and you're gonna hear this word a lot of hope, but also to be able to see it, to be able to live it, to be able to experience it in the stories of those who came before us, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam whose entire life story is a story of hope. If you look at the arc of the life of the Prophet ﷺ and what he experienced for so long in his life, calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, dejection and rejection and you know uh, attack and humiliation, but it ended always, or there was always that glimmer, that ray of hope 
that then burst into an illumination of hope from his life, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he never lost hope as well. And that was something that's so beautiful about his life story and about just his character and his attitude. That regardless of what he was going through, that he always had that hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then you see that also manifest in his companions, alayhi salatu wa salam. And so it's like that this hope was, was infectious and contagious. That it went from him and that it exuded so much from him that it, you know, the, the companions couldn't help but be impacted by it and by taking and, and, and taking that hope in their own lives. And so we also find in their stories so much of this hope. And their stories are so beautiful as well because they were real people. Like these aren't, you know, a lot of times we, we, we love like superhero stories and, and you know, a, a lot of these, uh, these, these, you know, stories that, that we see that are kind of, you know, they're made up, right? At least I think Spider-Man is a made up concept, right? And so we find like inspiration and hope in those things, but they're not always grounded in reality. But when we hear the stories of the companions, we're talking about real people who had these real lives and experienced real struggles and were able to have this resilience and this persistence and to be inspired by their Islam and motivated by the way that they held on to this hope and what they were able to accomplish as real life people who bled like we bleed, who cried like we cried, who experienced those same things that we experience. And it was in the moments of the deepest darkness where a lot of times that hope would emerge. And sometimes even the cause of that darkness became the source of light and became a hope that we are able to sit here in 2020 at a time when there's a lot of darkness and we're looking for hope, but to be inspired by even those places that were sources of darkness and that became these shining illuminating lights that can help us move forward as well. And that's exactly the story of Ikrima radiallahu an. Ikrima, who's known most uh, famously as being the son of Amr ibn Hisham, who we know better as Abu Jahl. Ikrima, the son of Abu Jahl. And we don't need to spend much time talking about Abu Jahl because anyone who knows the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knows Abu Jahl. Because if you think of a personification, like if you want to say the enemy of Islam personified, the first image that you think of, the first name that pops to mind is who? It's Abu Jahl, right? And so Abu Jahl becomes like synonymous with enmity towards Islam and specifically to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that's why you find almost every story that you find that someone is stepping up in that Meccan phase, in that time, even all the way up until Badr, to stand at the forefront of fighting the Prophet ﷺ, of opposing him, of making fun of him, of attacking him, of attacking his followers, of, of actually killing his followers. You find Abu Jahl was at that forefront. And so you can imagine the household of Abu Jahl, right? You can imagine the conversations that are happening in the house of Abu Jahl around the dinner table to say, right? And you can imagine what's being given and what's being inherited by his son, Ikrima, radiallahu an. And so even if you say that, for example, Ikrima never had a personal issue with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa just the influence of the household that he grows up in, there's no doubt that he also carries with him that enmity against the Prophet ﷺ. Because it was something that he inherited. It was something that he took. And Ikrima radiallahu an was also one of the leaders of his people. Ikrima was 30 years old when the Prophet ﷺ was given revelation. So he's 10 years younger than the Prophet ﷺ. And at that point, he's known amongst the people of Mecca, not just as the son of Abu Jahl, which Abu Jahl was known before as Abu Al-Hakim, the father of wisdom. But then because of his actions, he becomes known as the father of ignorance. But he was known. I mean, he was one of the leaders, one of the most respected, looked up to people in his town, in his society, in Mecca. 
And so his son carries with him that name as well. And his son carries with him the status and the position that he earned or that he inherited from his father. And so Ikrima, in his own right as well, was known to be a strong warrior, was known to be a, a skilled horseman, and someone who was skilled in the weapons and in the art of war. And so he had, in, in, in a society where they loved and they valued that courage and that, you know, that, that strength and that ability to fight, he's considered one of the stars of Mecca. Unfortunately, though, at that time, he also carried from his father not just his name, but that same animosity to the Prophet ﷺ. He had a lot of these good qualities, the courage, the strength, the honor. But unfortunately, when it was mixed with this hatred, when it was mixed with this animosity, it led to a, uh, him being at the forefront with his father against the Prophet ﷺ. And so we see here already, you know, the importance of family, the importance of in a good or a bad way, in a good influence or in a bad influence, because Ikrima is carrying on what his father had taught him or what his father is, is doing in his own actions of being at the forefront against the Prophet ﷺ. And that's then what we find with Ikrima as well. And so in every moment that he is able to, to show enmity towards Islam and towards the Muslim, he does that. He accompanies his father at Badr. Okay? And he's there as he watches his father. So he's a warrior, he's a soldier with his father, but he's there as he watches his father being killed. And not only that, and so he sees, like that some of the narrations mention, he actually sees like the last moments of his father, the, the, the dying moments of, of his father. And not only that, but because, you know, we know what happens in Badr. The Muslims win and the rest, anyone who is not captured from Quraysh, from the disbelievers, they have to, they have to flee. And so he flees without even being able to take the body of his father, right? And so you can imagine now, right? Picture this, that before it was an inherited hatred, it was an inherited animosity towards Islam and to the Muslims towards the Prophet ﷺ. Now at this point though, he actually has substance to fuel the fire of his hatred, right? Because before it was, this is just what, this is just how it is, right? This is my father's against the Muslims. I'm, I'm with my father. We know, especially in those times, that what your family was and, and that, that tribalism is that you were loyal, right? To your family, to your tribe above all else. And that's why Islam was so, you know, uh, it, was, it, was, it was so amazing and it was so revolutionary because it put something above that tie of family in those tribes, which was the bond of Iman, the bond of faith, right? But now imagine he didn't have anything substantial to show animosity towards Islam and the Muslims, but now when his father has been killed, now he comes with revenge. And now to him, even though it's not justified, right? But to him, there's substance now for his hatred against the Muslims. And that's why you find one year later at the battle of Uhud, not only is he a participant in that battle, but he is at the front of the army. He's actually the leader of the left flank of the army, right? And so he's coming to Uhud, not just with a thirst for revenge, but also riling up the rest of that army with other people like Khalid ibn Walid who lost someone in Badr, Abu Sufyan who had lost his own son in Badr. And so the, leader of the, the leaders of this army are riling up for to get revenge against Islam and against the Muslims. And even his own wife, Umm Hakim, who's going to come in this story in such a beautiful way later, right? Even she accompanies the army at the battle of Uhud to be able to be like the motivator for, for the army. They would sometimes take some of their, their wives, their women, to basically like help motivate and push the army forward. And so she was there also accompanying, right? So you're talking now about not just a person who has animosity towards Islam, but you're talking about a family here. 
that is at the forefront of fighting against Islam and against the Prophet A few years later also, at the Battle of Khandaq, that you find that Ikrimah is at the forefront again. And even though we know in the Battle of Khandaq, the Battle of the Trench, there's not a lot of fighting that goes on, right? In fact, it's very, very minimal. But guess who was one of the people who actually engaged in fighting, who jumped over, the, who was able through his skill, through his talent, to jump over a narrow part of the trench and to be able to go and try to fight and try to stir up trouble. Ikrima was one of those people, right? And he, you know, nothing happened to him there. He was able to retreat safely. But you see at every moment where there's an opportunity to fight against Islam, Ikrima is there. And this lasts until the last possible moment. Even at the Fetch of Mecca, the conquest of Mecca, which is an example that we always use as an example of forgiveness, right? From the Prophet وسلم, from the Muslims, that this is a new page that's turned over for the people of Mecca. Go, you are free. There's no blame on you. Even then, Ikrima chooses to fight. I want you to, I want you just to imagine that, right? Because we're not just talking about just a neutral party here who's, you know, a disbeliever because they choose to be a disbeliever. But we're talking about someone even in this moment who's still choosing animosity and enmity. And so he's from that small, small band of people who chooses to still fight at a time where literally almost anywhere you would go, you would find safety and security. Whoever is in Masjid al-Haram, he's safe. Whoever is in the house of Abu Sufyan, he's safe. Whoever is in their own home is safe. Ikrimah still chooses to fight. And so some of the scholars say this is the reason that the Prophet ﷺ, even on the Fath, the conquest of Mecca, made Ikrimah from the very, very few people who still had to be held responsible for their crimes. Right? And so you have a general amnesty, but then you have a few considered like war criminals who still have to be held responsible for their crimes. And you can see Ikrima was one of them, and this is probably the reason why, right? And so when Ikrima, when he realizes that fighting is not going to be of any benefit, what does he do? He flees. He runs away. He leaves Mecca. And he doesn't know where to go at this point, but he knows he has to go and he has to go far away. Right, because now he is someone who who's who is you know a wanted man, right? Like dead or alive, he's wanted because of his crimes, because of what he has done before. And so Ikrima has to leave and he has to go far away. And he recognizes that he can't like he can't just go next door to Ta'if, right? He's known and they know he's they're looking, he's being sought after, and he's not going to be safe. Right? There's no like disguises that he can just walk around and, and pretend like take on a new identity. No, he, he's gone. And so he actually leaves all the way to the coast. Like he's on his way trying to go to Yemen, heading in that direction. He gets all the way to the coast. And he actually wants to take uh, a boat and just go wherever he can. And so there's actually a few cool narrations uh, that, that kind of mention what happened in this time and in this moment. One of the narrations, it mentions that he tried to get on a boat and, and like the captain of that, of that boat, he told him, he said, you can only get on if you, if you akhlas. He's like, what, what do you mean akhlas? Like he means, that means to purify. Like, what do you mean by that? He says, say la ilaha illallah. So it turns out that this guy was, was, might have been a Muslim, right? And, and he said, he said, I ran away from saying la ilaha illallah. You think I'm going to say la ilaha illallah to get on a boat? Right? And actually, this, the reason that I mentioned this particular narration, because it shows something valuable as well. It shows this idea, and this was something that was common actually amongst the Arabs, is that they didn't believe in like, you know, faking it to be able to save their lives. Right? And that's why hypocrisy was considered such a like shameful thing. Because for them, it was like, I'd rather die holding on to what I believe and, and, and being truthful about it, that I disbelieve, than to pretend not to be, or than to pretend to be a believer, right? And so they mentioned, so, that, so he leaves this, this person. Then it mentions that he actually did get on another boat. 
And so uh, while, while they're on their boat, they don't get too far out until a storm hits. And now the captain of that ship, the captain of that ship tells those who are on this boat, he says to them, he says, your idols that you worshipped on land are not going to benefit you here. Right? So at this point, أخلصوا, purify or be sincere to Allah. Right? They knew Allah. And Allah mentions this in the Quran. That when they got, when, when people get on a ship, when they're in a moment of desperation, they forget all of those other things. They forget all of the idols, all the things that they called out besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so Ikrima, he says, he thinks to himself, and this is like one of his aha moments, right? And it takes his life being at risk here. And he says, if, there, if those idols are not going to benefit me here at sea, then they're not going to benefit me on land either. And so he actually, in some of the narrations that mentions, he actually at this point turns to Allah. And he says, oh Allah, if you save me from this, I'll go back to the Prophet wasallam, and I'll put myself in front of him. And I know he's someone who is forgiving and who is merciful. And this here is so beautiful to me. Why? Because he, he's able to recognize, he knows that his, that his neck is on the line. He knows that he's wanted dead or alive. And his blood is at, at this point, it, it's worthless. Right? He's, he's a wanted war criminal at this point. But in this moment, not only does he realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is true and that he finds this moment of, of sincerity here, but also here he recalls the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the characteristics that he remembered or that he knew most about him. That he was forgiving and that he was merciful. And so he knows that he can go back to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He knows that even if he's a wanted man, that there's still a glimmer of hope that I can go back to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because what I know about him is that he is someone of forgiveness and someone of mercy. Brothers and sisters, this is really an important point. A lot of people may want to come back to the community, to the family, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they have to be, they have to know, they have to have confidence that there is a place for them to go back to at that time that they're ready to go back. They have to recognize that there's someone who hasn't given up on them, that they can feel that there is a that there is hope. If maybe even they've given up hope on themselves, but there's someone who they knew who they remembered that they had hope in that they can go back to. To keep that door open, even for people that, in like in this case, we see there's no way this person is going to accept Islam. This person is someone who is actually wanted and their life is on the line, but he still remembers the Prophet ﷺ in this moment. And so he actually is saved and he gets back to shore to the same place that he was. While all of this is happening, you kind of go back to Mecca. We seen shift to Mecca. And at this moment also, you have a group of women. This is around the conquest of Mecca, right? You have a group of women who come to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to give the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam bay'ah, to accept Islam, to give, to show that, you know, we, we've committed our loyalty is here with Islam, with the Muslims, with you, Ya Rasulullah. Amongst these people is Hind, bint Utba, right? Hind, uh, the, the wife of Abu Sufyan. She accepts Islam here, right? And we know the story there with, you know, with uh, Hamza and, and, and these things that happen as well. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he accepts her Islam, of course. With Hind, you have another Hind, okay? And her name is Um Hakim. And I think she's like the unsung hero of this story. So beautiful that she comes to the Prophet ﷺ and she accepts Islam. Iman enters her heart. She gives bay'ah. She gives the Pledge of Allegiance to the Prophet ﷺ. And what does she do? She knows that her husband is wanted. She knows that the Prophet ﷺ gave command that this is someone who is deserving of being held accountable for their crimes. 
And so she asks for safety for her husband. She says, Ya Rasulullah, amminhu. Please, Ya Rasulullah, give him aman, and he give him safe passage. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so beautiful. He doesn't say, what, excuse me? Do you, like, you should accept Islam and move on. Don't worry about your husband. Do you know what he did? Do you know what you did for you to come and ask me for something? You were there at Uhud too. Uhud was a very, very painful moment for the Muslims. And for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in specific. It was something that he remembered years and years later. It was something that he was affected by years and years later. But he doesn't hold any of this against Umm Hakim. And even at this point, with Ikrimah, <coughs> in the position that he's in, and what he's done, and now the, the ruling that has been placed on him, the Prophet wasallam he says, huwa amin. That he is safe. That he is secure. Meaning he has safe passage to come back. And so she even at this point, she said, Ya Rasulullah, give me something, a, a sign to, that I can show him and that I can show others as well. Because <laughs> Ikrimah is, is, is a wanted man. Someone finds him, he's in trouble, right? So, she, so some of the narration said that he gave, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he gave her his imama. He gave her his turban or a stick that he had that he used to use to show this is from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's a sign of, of safety. For the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But I just want to pause here and like look at, uh, at, at, this, at this wife. Look at this beautiful family member. And, and how she, when she accepts Islam, what does she want right away? She wants good for her husband. Right? This is her family. This is, you know, regardless of <clears throat> the fact even that he ran away, she still wants good for him. And you know, the, the whole theme of uh, of this series is is family, right? Like gathering together to listen to uh, a, a stories as a family, and 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 here this point it really makes us appreciate and and recognize uh, the 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 value of our families, and how our relationship with our families is a relationship that is is built off of love, but built also off of of wanting what's best for each other, right? love for the well-being of her husband here just like we have the love for the well-being of our families we know how you know especially being quarantined with our families and you know seeing them all the time and it's like with any blessing that we're so used to we take it for granted right and so our families become the ones that we fight with most often our families become the one that you know we have a hard time finding something good to say about them Right? Our families become the ones that we ignore maybe the most, right? But th what she shows us here is, is that this connection of family should translate into this love and into this desire for well-being for each other. And not only does she do that, and she now has safety for her husband guaranteed from the Prophet ﷺ, but then she actually goes out to find him, Okay. And, and this is not an easy task, as you can imagine. Right? We're not talking about, you know, she just gets in her air-conditioned car, right? And she turns on her Google Maps and she just puts in, find Ikrimah. I have his cell phone, you know, pinged. I, can, I know where I can get, I can find him, right? It, it's, it's not like that at all. And subhanAllah, even when I was, you know, you know, when I came across this story, this is one of the things that I thought of. Like, how did people go anywhere before uh, navigation before gps like with, before google maps how did you leave your neighborhood right it's hard to sometimes to find yani, a place five ten minutes away she's willing to make a journey at this point across the arabian desert at a time where it's not very safe for anyone to be traveling let alone a woman by herself and she actually does experience some hardship and some difficulty along the way but she persists and she, and she is so resilient that she wants this goodness for, for her husband, for Ikrimah, radiallahu an. And so she actually ends up finding him on the coast. And she tells him that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam has guaranteed you safety. And he's, and he's surprised, right? And as we'll see, he's, he doesn't almost, it's almost like he doesn't fully believe it. 
But this, in coordination with what he experienced on the boat, with what he experienced on his journey, he agrees to go back to Mecca. And he accompanies, and it's him now and his wife. And you know, subhanAllah, even on the journey back, he wants to spend the night with his wife, right? Like, like normally you would have. And his wife refuses. And so you see this beautiful balance here as well, that she's willing to cross literally deserts to be able to be with her husband and to find him and to bring him back safely. But she's not willing to do anything that's, that's uh, displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so she brings him back to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam hears that Ikrimah is coming back, he tells the companions to basically like take it easy. Because even it, it was, it's mentioned that the companions start to get a little bit riled up. Ikrimah is coming back. And they remember where he was at Badr. They remember where he was at Uhud. They remember where he was at the Battle of the Trench. They remember where he was even at the conquest of Mecca not too long ago. And so they get a little bit, you know, like he's coming. Now it's our time to get him. And the Prophet ﷺ, he stops them. And what's interesting here is that the Prophet ﷺ had given that safe passage to Ikrima not on the condition of him coming as a believer. He just gave him safe passage. And so there's no guarantee now, even at this point, that he's going to accept Islam. But the Prophet ﷺ has confidence that that's what's going to happen, right? And so he says that he's going to come to you now as an immigrant, yani muhajira. And even in the narration mentions mu'mina, he's going to come to you even now as a believer, showing that the Prophet ﷺ had this hope in him. He said, and he tells them something very, very important. He says, "Fala tasubbu aba." Very, very, this is actually my favorite part of the entire story. The Prophet ﷺ has the emotional intelligence, the awareness. He says he's going to come to you now. Don't curse his father. Who's his father? His father is Abu Jahl. If anyone is, being, is deserving of being cursed for all of the crimes he did, He's literally the Fir'aun of this Ummah. The Prophet ﷺ called him. If anyone is deserving of that, it's him. But still he says to him here, he, sa he says to the companions, don't curse his father. Because when you curse the dead, it bothers, it hurts, it harms the living, and it doesn't reach the dead. It doesn't even reach, meaning you're going to hurt the feelings of Ikrimah who's coming already in a vulnerable state. He's already defeated, right? Don't add to that. And here it shows us as well that if someone is coming and they want to do better or they're on their journey of trying to get better or even for ourselves, that don't hold someone's past against them when they're trying to get better. Don't stop someone's journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to settle an old score or to kind of, to make them feel less worthy because of something that they did in the past, or even worse, that there's someone from their, fam uh, from their family did that in the past. That a person, when they want to make that change, that we're supposed to encourage them, we're supposed to be there for them. And also the Prophet ﷺ, he shows us the importance of our words. How many things do we say to someone that we may not even pay that much attention to? that that thing stays with them for the rest of their lives. I know a brother personally, and he's, he's very close to me. And he told me that he was at a, 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 an MSA talk or something like that in college. And the one who was giving that talk was also someone that we know. He, he's, he's, he's involved in, in community work and da'wah and stuff. And he said something to my friend in passing that till this day, my friend is unable to forgive him for. He's saying, I tried. I've been able to forgive anyone and everyone. And he's been through a lot for this and for that. But this word stuck with me. This word has stuck with me until now. And I just can't do it. And maybe this person, actually for sure, the one who said it has no idea that maybe he forgot even that he said it, but no idea of the impact of it. 
right? So these two things here that don't judge people for something beyond their control or for something that happened in their past, especially if they're trying to come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be careful with what we say to people because it may be the thing that stops them from being able to come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he sees Ikrima, he doesn't address him as, oh, you the one who ran away from us or oh, the one who is not, you know, the one who gave us a hard time. But he, he, he labels him or he addresses him in his current state with what he is now. He says, Marhaban bir Rakib al Muhajir. He says, Welcome to the one who has ridden to us, who has rode to us as a Muhajir, as an immigrant, has safe passage with us. And the narration says that the Prophet Wathaba ilayh, he literally hurried, he ran to him when he saw him. <laughs> look at what we talked about, what Ikrimah did, and look at the response of the Prophet ﷺ. When he saw someone coming to him and hoped in goodness that would come from him, he ran to him. And he and to the point that even his rida, the, what he was wearing on top, and as like his his shawl or his cover, it fell from, from his shoulder ﷺ. Right? And he welcomed him, and Ikrimah, at this point, <clears throat> he told him, he says, you are, you are safe, right? Or, or when he came to him, right? Uh, Ikrimah actually asked him. He says, my wife told me that you gave me a man, that you gave me safe passage, that I'm safe. And, and I, I thought this part was really interesting that he says, it's not that he doesn't believe his wife, but the way that I looked at it was like, it's almost like he doesn't, believe that he would actually be deserving of or get that kite that type of safe passage or security right like he knows he doesn't deserve it so it's almost like like he's he's amazed that he's actually getting safe passage from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and this also shows us that islam gives us hope for forgiveness even when we can't forgive ourselves or even when we feel like we don't deserve it and so the Prophet ﷺ, he told him, he says, Sadaqat. She was truthful. You are safe. Again, without even the condition of him accepting it still. And so Ikrimah radiallahu anhu, he asks the Prophet ﷺ, he says, so what exactly is it that you call to? Right? Sometimes people fight Islam and they don't even know what they're fighting. Ignorance and fear, when they come together, they equal hatred. And so the Prophet ﷺ, he told him, uh, you know, what Islam is, the basics, the shahada, the salah, the zakah. And he said, he said, you're calling to, so Ikram, he said, you're calling to something that's beautiful and something that's true. And you were the most honest of people amongst us, nas, the most righteous of people, the most loyal of people. And so he knows that what he fought for those 20 years before, that, that there was no legitimacy to why he was fighting. And he knew and he recalled the character of the Prophet ﷺ. Not just what you're calling to is beautiful, but the one who is calling to that has always been so beautiful and has always manifested the best of character. And this is the importance of us in our character, in our own da'wah, in the way that we deal with people, in the way that we deal with our family. As one of our teachers said, people are listening to you, but they're listening to you with their eyes. And so Ikrima radiallahu an accepts Islam. What unlocked for him now to think about Islam with a clear mind? Maybe this is the first time that he hears about Islam without the veil of hate covering his heart. It was the character of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It was the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam willing to give him an opportunity to hear Islam, to, to, to be forgiven for crimes that you would never think that anyone would be forgiven for. And so he gives the shahada right there. And the Prophet ﷺ was extremely happy. And so the Prophet ﷺ, and this just shows you know, the heart of the Prophet ﷺ, that the joy that he had when people were guided to Islam. And, and, and he honored Ikrima. And this is the heart you know, of someone who legitimately and genuinely wanted good for people. And he told Ikrima, he said, 
you can ask me for anything and I'll give it to you, Ikrimah. What does Ikrimah radiallahu anh, ask for? He doesn't ask for anything materialistic, anything physical. He says, Ya Rasulullah, he says, I ask that you forgive me and I ask that you ask Allah to forgive me for all of the enmity that I've shown, for all of the, the moments that I was against you, Ya Rasulullah, for all of the words that I said in front of you about you or behind your back about you. And the Prophet ﷺ gives him this most valuable ask and he makes dua for him in this exact same way and the things that he asked for and such a beautiful dua that he makes for him. And Ikrimah at this point, he promises himself and he promises the Prophet ﷺ, he says, Ya Rasulullah, whatever I spent against Islam, I'm going to spend double and multiply for Islam and for the sake of Allah. Anything and any moment that I fought against Islam, now I will fight for Islam and for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, multiply. And Ikrimah here, he shows us something beautiful. He shows us that when we do want to make that change, that we try our best to make amends, to fix the mistakes of our past, to mend those fences whenever and wherever possible. And Ikrimah radiallahu an, he lived up to those words and he lived up to that promise. And for the rest of his life, he was someone who was at the forefront of fighting in the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was someone who was known to love the Qur'an. That when he would read the Qur'an, he would like put it to his face and he would kiss it and he would say, Kalamu Rabbi, Kalamu Rabbi, the words of my Lord, the words of my Lord. Up until the battle of Yarmouk in the 13th year after Hijrah. He's been Muslim for less than five years. And the battle of Yarmouk is its own story. But what the Muslims are up against, and, and a small army, relatively speaking, Ikrimah takes the charge in that battle as well. And he is one of, uh, he is the leader of a group who says that we're going to fight until victory or until death. And they pledge uh, like to give their lives in this battle to be able to overcome the Romans at this decisive battle. And Khalid ibn Walid, who's the leader of the army, he tells him, he's like, don't do that, right? Like to pledge that you're going to fight in this way until death. You're, it's it's going to be a big loss, a big blow to the Muslims if you die. And Ikrimah here, he says, he says, Kuntu wa ana ala al Akunu wa ana ala al He says, I was at the forefront when I was on falsehood. And now when I'm on truth, I'm going to cower away. He says, no way. He says, you had more time with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I was a criminal and what I did, me and my father, let me make up for it. And he shows that when a person makes that, that, that promise or that, uh, that desire to change, that they follow it up in the best way that they can. And this is exactly what he does, radiallahu an, and he passes away in the battle of Yarmouk as a martyr with over 70 wounds on his body. And even at the end of his life, the way that he ends his life is so beautiful even. That he's on the battlefield in a state where he is in his last moments. And they come to bring him water to just ease the pain of what he's going through. Cold water on a very hot day, 70 wounds. And, he's, and he's, as he's about to be given water to drink, he sees uh, one of the other Muslims who needs water. He's kind of like, like signaling for water. And so he says, I'm not going to drink, give him first. And that person also, that Sahabi also says the same thing to someone else until they go to three or four of them and they come back and they find Ikrimah and then the rest have passed away. To pass away from this world to inshallah be able to drink from the, the rivers of Jannah. Ikrimah radiallahu an, he shows us so much in terms of being able to make that change, to make that, that, you know, that new, that fresh start and what that entails. If we're not given hope in our own lives, in the lives of our family members, maybe who we feel are far away from the right path and it hurts us and it pains us, the story of Ikrima gives us that hope. How many people do we spiritually kill by not providing for them a path to come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By not leaving the door open for them to walk back through. How many people have we written off as evil or hopeless or beyond redemption? And as a result, we've missed out 
on the goodness and the potential that they may bring to this ummah, to their families, to the societies. It's a lot easier for us to write people off, to condemn, to condemn them, than to be patient with them and to facilitate a second chance. But the prophetic way, as we see here in the story of Ikrimah, is that, is to take the path of hope, to take the path of, of facilitation, of, of allowing for people to come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of always leaving that door open. 20 years fighting Islam, five years as a Muslim, four times the amount fighting Islam as the time being a Muslim. What matters is not what has passed and what's in the past, but what matters is now and what's to come. And regardless of how deep that darkness was or is, there's always a light that can ex extinguish that darkness. And this is the story of Ikrima, radiallahu an. Jazakumullah khair. I hope, inshallah, that it's something that we can find inspiration in, in ourselves, in our family members, and those who are around us. Uh, Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. I think we all need like a, a deep breath and a glass of water after that. Jazakallah khair. That was, you did more than justice to the story. And uh, it's been, it's a privilege to have you as part of this storytelling program. Alhamdulillah. I'm going to give you guys a couple of minutes, a few minutes we have to ask the Sheikh any questions that you have. Uh, so on YouTube, Facebook, Facebook, uh, 360, just drop everything into the chat box and on Faith Essentials, of course, as well. And uh, we'll try to get as many questions as we can in the next few minutes, inshallah. In the meantime, Sheikh, I have a couple of questions for yourself as well. Sure. Mashallah, I know that you're very well learned. Mashallah, you've had the privilege of, of learning from, from various scholars and from attending Medina University, but you've committed your life and your efforts to working with the youth. Uh, and I want to kind of hear from you directly. What's so crucial to you uh, about kind of motivating and working with the youth? And what have you kind of learned about what they're struggling with, the Muslim youth especially, uh, when it comes to their Islamic identities and Islamic knowledge in general? I mean, that's, that's, that's a very, uh, that's a lot to cover for sure. But what I will say is that getting the opportunity to work with the youth really has shown me how amazing the youth are and how amazing the youth can be when they're given a platform, when they're given an opportunity to learn, to come closer to Allah, to be a part of something, you know, bigger than themselves in, in a community, to, to just, to be in that kind of environment. They do things that are, amazing that every single day that I interact with them and that I see, you know, what they come up with on their own, I'm inspired. It's actually one of the, the biggest Iman boosters for me to see young people when there's so many opportunities for them to turn away and even to be like, to find justifiable excuses. Like we don't have a place, we don't have nowhere to learn all of these things, but still choose to come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? That's super inspiring. And so even like the this Al-Maghrib, the, the kids program, I mean, like we always emphasize, especially with like the, that younger age, that if we can get them then, if we can like pull them in and just, just show them Islam, right? It's not even like convinced, like just show them Islam, that you are getting people who are set for life. People who are like, it's like engraving into rock that even if they kind of kind of go off a little bit, even if they kind of, you know, veer away, that they'll always have that uh, with them that they can come back to. So it's, it's so, so important. Even in our youth program, like middle school age, we say like, that's the most important program that we have because that's where you're kind of, you know, able to, to have the most influence on, on these minds that are so, uh, so fresh and so, so willing uh, to engage it as well. Beautifully said, Sheikh. Actually, I think that covers all the points I wanted to address. So Jazakallah khair. Uh, and of course, you guys can visit amagrib.org um, slash kids to learn more, inshallah, and, and be part of the, the launch of this program. Now, I see a lot of questions coming in, and I haven't prepared you, Sheikh, but we have a lot of young young viewers, so their questions are phrased a little bit differently than we're used to. Yeah, of course. Uh, they're very well uh, said. Okay, so we have a few questions. What is, uh, did he have any other siblings, and did they end up converting to Islam as well? That's a good question. I, 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 I found that he had uh, other like relatives and siblings from uh, like, uh, like what's called like Rabah, like weaning and these kind of things, you know, like where you have like a, a relative that is established almost like a brother based off of, uh, you know, the fact that you were weaned by the same by the same person. Uh, I didn't come across any specific other siblings that he had. I'm not saying he doesn't. I just didn't see them myself. I was so focused on him. <laughs> so. 
Perfect. Um, we have unfortunately several questions asking, did he die after at the end of the story? He passed away. He passed away, but it was a happy ending because he passed away as a martyr, as a shaheed in the Battle of Yarmouk. And so his, his you know, short time of, of being Muslim, only five years, but, you know, he is, inshallah, from the people who, who, is, who, who will be in Jannah. And hopefully we'll be able to meet him in Jannah and, and hear his story directly from him. Perfect. Jazakallah khair. Uh, the next question is from Ilhan. Um, and she's asking, if you can't get anything in Jannah, then if I ask for everything to go back in the world, would that work? Oh, sorry. If you can get anything in Jannah, then if I ask for everything to go back to the world, would that work? That's a good question. So um, you're not going to want to go back to the world in Jannah. So anything that you want in Jannah is going to be like in Jannah, right? So there's, you're not going to like want something, for example, that you can't uh, have or that's inappropriate for you to have or whatever everything that you want in jannah is going to be what you want but it's going to be in the context or in the confines of jannah itself and you're never going to want to become come back to the world but maybe you'll have your own like world in jannah as well i can see Johan is very happy with that answer so jazakallah the next question is how did he get to land in the storm did he float so they said uh, from what i came across that the the ship didn't sink and he was they were able to come back to shore they were able to come back to shore Perfect. the next is did ikrama have any children not that i know of not that i know of Perfect. i'm um, sure he did actually i'm sure he did but I, again i i'm not i don't know who they were specifically fair enough uh the next question is uh does did ikrama's wife pass away in the battle as well you said that she traveled with him no, she did not pass away in, in the Battle of Yarmouk. Okay, perfect. No. Um, the next is, was uh, the Prophet Sallallahu alive when he was martyred? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. No, he, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had passed away uh, a couple of years before that. A couple of years before that. But what we know is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away being, being pleased with Ikrima. Right. The next is, how old was he when he died? So he accepted, his, uh, he was 30 when he, uh, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sent. And so he passed away at the age of about 55. Okay, sounds amazing. The next is who brought him water? I don't know, <laughs> that's a good question. So they had like, you know, in the battles they would have people who would kind of go around and, and try to, you know, attend to uh, the fallen soldiers and those who were wounded and stuff. So someone like that. Amazing. The next is, um, is he buried in Baqi in Medina? No, no, he's buried where he, uh, he was martyred, near uh, Yarmouk, which is in the area of uh, Syria, uh, Jordan, in that area. Perfect. And there's a question saying, how old was he when he became Muslim? You said that it was five years before he passed away, correct, right? Five so years passed away. So 20 years after, so is it 20, about, he was about 50. He was about 50. Um, the next question is, uh, did he have a mom and what was her name? He did have a mom, but I can't recall the name of, uh, I, I came across it in, in his story. It's the wife of Abu Jahl. I, I don't remember her name. I don't remember her name. He did have a mom though. Yeah. The next is, was he rich? And I think we'll end off at this question. He, he was, he was, uh, definitely wealthy. He was definitely wealthy. I mean, he was the son of, of the, the ultimate leader in Mecca. And so he was wealthy. Okay, awesome sauce. Jazakallah khair. Sorry, Sheikh, that was a rapid fire. Uh, 101 about Ikrima ibn Abu Jahl, but alhamdulillah, now we have so much more to reflect on. And I hope to see more Ikrimas running around, inshallah, in the next few years. I uh, appreciate you once again coming in and sharing this uh, intense uh, story time with us. Inshallah, we look forward to having you back with us in the, in the coming year. Please take care of yourself and your family. And Jazakallah khair once again for coming to join the Amal Khair family. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Awesome. everyone who stuck around for those amazing questions. Uh, you guys are so specific with your questions that I haven't even thought of some of those questions that you've come up with. So mashallah, those were awesome. Uh, keep them coming. And of course, we have our second session starting in just a couple of minutes uh, with Sheikh Omar Sanaman. So I told you guys yesterday that today was going to be the, the day of Sheikh Omar's who are doing our story times, alhamdulillah. So we just finished off for those of you who joined us uh, a little bit later with Sheikh Omar Hadruj. Uh, on his amazing, amazing story 
time on the topic of light from darkness, finding hope from the story of Ikrimah, the son of Abu, Abu Jahl. Uh, if you missed any part of the story, inshallah, you can watch the recording later on. I know some, some of you are asking. Uh, so inshallah, don't worry. You can always uh, wait a little bit after this live session is over and there will be recording that you can go back and watch from the beginning. Um, but the next session that we have uh, set for you for the third uh, day of family first, inshallah, is of course with Sheikh Omar Salaman. And he has an interesting topic that I'm very curious about. And that is the story of the angel, the blind man, the leper, and the ball man. Um, so I'm really curious to see uh, what this story is going to be about. If you have any guesses, you can drop them in the chat right now. And if you would like to quickly run uh, and grab another snack, grab a drink, refresh, and uh, invite anybody who's missing right now to the live session, make sure you do so right now. Uh, Alhamdulillah, it was a pleasure uh, to have you. <laughs> okay, sorry, Sheikh, that's okay. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you with us, and I'm looking forward to having you for the next half an hour. We're going to cover the story with Sheikh Hamar Sanaman. We have only a couple more days left of story times, which is unfortunate, but Alhamdulillah that we got a chance to connect with you all. And if there's anybody that you wish could join you from your family or your friends, make sure that you invite them or you tag them in the chat right now uh, in the next couple of minutes before we get started. And while we're doing that, I want to remind you guys, because I know Alhamdulillah, we have a lot of new students who have uh, not yet actually taken anything or, or been familiar with Al Maghrib Institute. So this Family First series is actually being hosted by Al Maghrib Institute, which is why you probably see that in the titles uh, of the platforms, alhamdulillah. And uh, we are, have the privilege of, of being an Islamic education institution that teaches adults. And we've been very famous for that across the globe. Uh, we do on-site seminars, online seminars. We have a Quran teaching platform, and I'm going to cover some of that right now with you. But uh, we're now moving on and, and making sure that we expand to some of the most important audiences, uh, of course, that we have in the Ummah, and that's, of course, our children. Uh, so we're taking our years, almost two decades of experience teaching adults about being confident and, uh, and, and, and you know, knowing their deen with clarity. And now we're taking that to children, making sure they have that same level of, of confidence. Sheikh Omar Hadouj said it way more beautifully than I could have possibly said it uh, in terms of the importance of inspiring that confidence and how much you can do with that and how, how it's like engraving and rock at that stage of life. So it's really important for us as an institution to make sure that happens. And uh, you can find out more and support the efforts of Al Maghrib Institute's new project, Al Maghrib Kids, by going to almaghrib.org slash kids, inshallah. And I, I love seeing the uh, amazing salams that are coming in. Uh, Nuria, wa alaikum as -salam, from 10 years old, coming in from where? Uh, I thank you for those of you who are sharing where you're coming in from, your ages. And if you have siblings or other family members who are watching, uh, of course, please share their names so we can shout you out, inshallah. We're going to get started in just a couple of seconds uh, with Sheikh Hamar Um, But we look forward to having you guys warm up with us right now. I'm going to quickly check from YouTube, Facebook, who else has joined us since we've been going. Alhamdulillah, I know it's been a good hour. Mashallah, congratulations to those of you who've been uh, sticking around from the very beginning of the session. Uh, Nosheen, welcome again. Um, perfect. Jazakallah khair. I love to see that you're listening very carefully, Shazia, and, and your kids, alhamdulillah, as well. Um, and there's a bajillion of you on YouTube, <laughs> mashallah. Fatma from London, who's nine. Fatma, it's past your bedtime, but it's okay. This, you, this is a good excuse to stay up. Uh, Maryam, age five, mashallah, still washing. Zainab, Asiya from Virginia. Sabrine, uh, al Fatar. Uh, who's 15, mashallah. Okay, so I won't take too much more of your time. Just a reminder, once again, if you're loving this series and you want way more content just like this, that is relevant, that's exciting, uh, and that's even more catered to you as a kid and to parents, to your children, please make sure you join us by supporting amagrib.org slash kids and making this project come to life. Uh, we're super, super excited with all the possibilities that we have uh, as an institution to make this exciting and relevant and fun for the children. Hafsa, Hannah, and Omer from Seattle. Welcome, welcome, and welcome. Abdul, who's seven, mashallah, welcome. All right, Sheikh, I know you've uh, you've been waiting patiently with us. Alhamdulillah, Sheikh Omar number two <laughs> for today. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you doing? Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, I'm well. Alhamdulillah, amazing to hear. Uh, just out of curiosity for all the kids who are watching, um, who here has heard anything or seen anything from Sheikh Omar Salaman in the chat? I see a lot of yays and thumbs up and smiles, but uh, is there anybody who's watched Sheikh Omar before? Feel free to, to mention uh, in the chat box here on YouTube or anywhere else. Um, but we're excited, Sheikh, to kick off with your series today or your session today on the story of the angel, the blind man, the leper, and the bald man. I'm really curious, so I'm going to pass it off to you so we can jump in and ask you questions at the end. Bismillah. Inshallah. Bismillah. Khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everyone. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. Wassalamu ala rasulillah. 
wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. So uh, this story is actually one that I did cover in the Angel series, but I didn't cover in any detail. It's actually probably uh, the most watched video in the Angel series, I think, was uh, have you ever seen an angel, an angel in human form? And the story was mentioned just to simply establish that evidence that uh, it's possible, but not, not usually the case. Uh, so it doesn't happen much, but at the same time, it is, uh, it is possible. And this is a hadith that is used to talk about that, the story that the Prophet Sallallahu gave to us. Now, this hadith is loaded with lessons. It is a long hadith with a long story and it's loaded with lessons. And by the way, I don't know if we have any folks from Australia, but uh, one of the most beautiful people I've ever met and a dear friend, uh, Sheikh Abu Bakr Zaud in Australia, uh, he actually has a nice a nice uh, reflection on this hadith on YouTube. So if you search Abu Bakr Zaud and you search this hadith, uh, you'll find a nice reflection on it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him and increase him. Um, you know, beloved brother, mashallah, who does who does a wonderful job of extracting some of the gems of this hadith. So I, because of that, because I'm hoping you all will go watch that one as well, inshallah ta'ala, I'll extract some other benefits and some other lessons from the hadith. So the hadith is narrated from Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu that he heard Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed to test three people. One was a leper, one was a blind man, and one was a bald man. So he sent an angel to the leper. Now, I'm just going to say that obviously, um, you know, these three things are not the same thing. Uh, and that is actually the point of the hadith, that sometimes a person is tested with a blessing. Sometimes a person is tested with a hardship. Sometimes a person is tested with a small hardship, sometimes with a large hardship. Sometimes a person is tested with a small blessing and sometimes with a large blessing. And what do I mean by that? For some people, the smallest test is a big test to them because they don't maintain that perspective and that patience with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that gratitude. So a small test to them is equivalent to a big test uh, to someone else. And that's why you'll find that someone might have a crisis of faith. They might be, you know, have, have a really hard time with their iman, when something happens to them, that's not huge, but someone has something huge happen to them, you know, some major tragedy, but they still maintain their patience and they still maintain their love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and their perseverance. So it's not about the size of the test. It's about the person who is experiencing the test. Likewise with blessings. There are some people that subhanAllah, no matter how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses them, they're always humble. They're always grateful. You, you would not know it from looking at them. They don't act proud. And sometimes a person has so much from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah gives them so many blessings. But that only increases them in arrogance and only increases them in pride. And uh, sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a person so much and it only increases them in humility and shyness. For example, Uthman al-Ghani, Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Some of you mentioned the first uh, series. And Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu is one of my favorite Sahaba. And I don't just say that like we say that, you know, about Sahaba, like I love this person so much. I deeply love Uthman radiallahu anhu to the point that the first halaqa I ever gave was about Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And we know that Uthman was al-ghani. He was the wealthy man. He was so rich that he would always respond to the call. You know, if, if any of you have been to fundraisers, uh, and I'm sure every Muslim has been to many fundraisers, even in COVID, the virtual fundraisers, um, you know, the, the person that always raises their hand first or always is the first one to respond. Uthman radiallahu anhu was that person, always first to respond. But subhanAllah, even though Uthman was from the richest companions of the Prophet sallallahu he was from the shyest companions of the Prophet sallallahu So modest, so soft-spoken, so shy, he wasn't proud. And so the increase of Allah's blessing upon him only increased him in gratitude, which is very rare uh, for someone in that situation. And that's why he's so special. And even the angels were shy of Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him and be pleased with him. Sometimes Allah gives a person a little bit of goodness and they become proud and arrogant. They start to show off that goodness. They start to boast about it and they distance themselves from Allah. So it's not about the size of the blessing or the size of the hardship. It's about the person who is being tested with the blessing or with the hardship. And so in this situation, uh, 
certainly, you know, uh, baldness is not the same as blindness and not the same as leprosy, which is to be tested with a person's skin. But they are all grouped together to deliver the story, uh, the message uh, about these three men and how they responded to the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon them. So Allah sent an angel to all three of them. First, Allah sent the angel to the leper. Now, the leper, by the way, uh, is a, you know, a person who uh, has a skin condition. Leprosy was very common in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. And in fact, in old civilizations, leprosy was very, very common. And people would treat lepers like something was wrong with them. And that, you know, maybe they've been cursed. Maybe someone put magic on them. Maybe it's because they're evil. They're evil omens. They carry something bad. And of course, this is not the case. And you might remember the story of Ayyub alayhi salam. Our prophet Ayyub alayhi salam was tested with it and people shunned him because of his skin condition as if it was contagious and as if he was a bad omen. So this beloved prophet of Allah is the opposite of this hadith where you'll see people go from uh, you know, a hardship to an ease. He went from ease where he had everything to hardship and the people shunned him and they treated him horribly and even his friends left him. And this is not the way of Islam. The Prophet ﷺ, he taught us not to stare at a person, not to even stare at a person. He particularly mentioned والسلام, a person with leprosy because you might hurt their feelings. You might make them feel like something is wrong with them. And we all know that everyone is tested in different ways and we should not do that. So sensitivity is something very important we take from this. In any case, the angel goes to the leper and he says to the leper, what is it that you like most? What would you like most? And he says, I would love to have a good color and a good skin because the people have become repulsed by me. They don't come near me. They're repulsed by me. And so it wasn't just his appearance. It was the way that people shunned him because of his appearance. So the angel goes to him and the angel touches him and his illness was cured. And he was given a beautiful color, a beautiful skin. And then the angel does not stop there. He says to him, what kind of property would you like best? And so he mentions camels. Now, when he says to him, what kind of property would you like? You know, there is a, some sort of a connection here that all three of these men that are going to be mentioned in the Hadith are poor. And for some of them, the conditions that they are in contribute to the poverty that they have, right? That's implied here, that especially when it comes to the lepers, they would be shunned from the marketplace. They, they wouldn't be able to earn because people treated them in a certain way. And so now he goes to a different place where he's going to have beautiful skin. And at the same time, he's going to be wealthy. So he said, I like camels. And camels are the best of the animals, right? In terms of their price, in terms of their value and what they bring. They are, uh, you know, you're able to travel upon them. There is milk from the camels. There's so much blessing from them, right? So the angel then gives the leper a pregnant she-camel. And the angel says to that person, may Allah bless you in it. And when the angel says, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you in it, then the, the camel is going to become pregnant and the camel is going to give birth to many, many, many camels. So this person now suddenly went from being repulsive and poor to being beautiful and wealthy, okay? Then the angel goes to the man who is bald, and he says to the bald man, what do you like most? So he mentions that I like good hair, and I wish to be cured of this because the people are repulsed by me. Now, by the way, of course, when it comes to baldness, even some of the Sahaba were bald. It's not like baldness is a curse in any way. Uh, it's uh, one of the mo it's, it's the most natural of the three conditions that are mentioned here. Not the most natural, but the most common, if you will. It is uh, something that we find even, again, from some of the Sahaba of the Prophet Sallallahu But certainly, as we can see, that sometimes hair is, um, you know, uh, described as, as, a, as, you know, a form of um, appearance and a form of attraction and things of that sort. And so here, uh, this man says that I would love to have good hair. And so the angel wipes over his head and suddenly he has good hair, right? Just like the commercials. If you saw the commercial and you see the people that suddenly grow a lot of hair, uh, this is actual real life where an angel touched his head and the hair grew on his head. 
And then the angel says to him, what kind of property do you like best? So he says, cows. So the angel gives him a pregnant cow. It says, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you in it. Then the angel goes to the blind man and he says to the blind man, what do you like best? He said, I like that Allah would restore my eyesight so that I may see the people. So the angel touches his eyes and he has his eyesight back. Now, subhanAllah, uh, out of all three of the people, this man had the most severe condition, okay? Um, this is a, a very difficult test and trial that again, some of the Sahaba went through, some of the greatest scholars of Islamic history uh, went through, and some of the greatest people in the world have gone through this test. It is a, a very unique type of test. And uh, if you've ever seen when a person who, you know, in some of these villages where they don't have access to certain health care, they have a curable uh, blindness and they have a certain operation and surgery and they see the world for the first time. SubhanAllah, it's, it's a profound sense of gratitude that those people have, often children that have never, that first time seeing the world is 12, 13 years old. And so in this hadith, you have a man, it doesn't mention when he was blind, if he went blind you know, uh, in his childhood or if he was born blind, but uh, he wanted eyesight so that he could see the people. The angel touches his eyes, he opens his eyes and he can see. The angel says, what type of property would you like best? So he mentions sheep. Uh, and so the angel gives him a pregnant sheep. Now, the sheep, by the way, is the most simple ask, subhanAllah. And that's one of the things to take from this, that from the animals, uh, that were asked about, the most simple ask was the ask of the sheep. The camels, of course, are the most expensive, then the cows, and then the sheep. So this man asked for the least in terms of property, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him what he asked for. So afterwards, all three of the pregnant animals gave birth to their children, to young ones, and they multiplied, and they brought forth so much that one of the three men had a herd of camels filling an entire valley. And the other one had a herd of cows filling an entire valley. And the other one had a flock of sheep filling an entire valley. Then the angel comes back to the three. <clears throat> How does the angel come back? The angel comes back in the shape and appearance of a leper. And he goes to the man who used to be a leper. Now he has beautiful skin and he's not poor, he's rich. And so this man shows up and he is a vision of the past. He says, I am a poor man who lost all means of livelihood while on a journey. So none will satisfy my need except Allah and then you. In the name of him who has given you such nice skin and so much property, I ask you to give me a camel so that I may reach my destination. SubhanAllah, the, the angel even reminds the man of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he is reminding him of his previous self <clears throat> by the way that he looks and by his condition of poverty, which is what the man was in. And at the same time, he is reminding him of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who provided those things and asks him to give him the same thing that he once did. What does the man say? The man says, I have many obligations, so I cannot give anything to you. <clears throat> The angel says, I think I know you. Were you not once a leper to whom the people had a strong aversion? Weren't you a poor man and that Allah gave you all of his property, all of this property? And what did he say? He said, no. He said, I got this through the inheritance of my forefathers and this is all mine. So he denied his past as well. So subhanAllah, how many chances is the man getting? Reminded of his own condition, reminded that this is from Allah. Uh, and the man is reminding him to give him in the name of Allah. Reminded of his past in poverty that didn't Allah give this to you. And he says, I got this through inheritance, that I was always this rich. And so the angel responds and says, if you are telling a lie, then may Allah make you as you were before. Then the angel disguised in the shape and appearance of a bald man <clears throat> goes to the bald man. And he says to him the same thing as he said to the first one. And he too responded in the same way as the first one did. So he goes to the bald man. He's poor. He is in the same situation. He asks him for a cow. The bald man says, I can't give you anything. He says, weren't you the man who was bald and poor? And you suffered in the same way that I did. 
And the man says, no, I inherited all of this from my forefathers. The angel responded and said, if you are telling a lie, then may Allah make you as you were before. <clears throat> and finally, the angel disguised in the shape of a blind man goes to the blind man and says, I am a poor man and a traveler whose means of livelihood have been exhausted while on a journey. I have no one to help me except Allah and then after him you, yourself. I ask you in the name of him who has given you back your eyesight to give me a sheep so that with its help I may complete my journey. So he goes to the blind man again. He's blind. He's also poor. And he says, I'm asking you in the name of the one who gave you your eyesight to give me a sheep. The man says, no doubt, I was blind and Allah gave me my eyesight. I was poor and Allah made me rich. So take anything you wish from my property. By Allah, I will not stop you from taking anything you need of my property, which you can take for Allah's sake. SubhanAllah, the angel asked him for just one sheep. And he said, take all of it if you want. He did not withhold anything because Allah did not just give him one sheep. In reality, Allah gave him the whole valley of sheep. And this man was immediately reminded of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so his generosity was open because he knew that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was also generous with him. So he said, take as much of it as you want for Allah's sake. The angel replied, keep your property with you. You three have been tested. And Allah is pleased with you and angry with your two companions. There are several benefits to take from this. As I mentioned, notice that, you know, the moral of the story, first and foremost, is that so often when we are stingy, we forget the moments where we were most vulnerable and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took care of us. And that's why the Prophet sallam mentioned that, you know, the best charity sometimes, for some, the best charity is when a person is healthy, when they have everything that they need, when they are, you know, in, in complete ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they have not forgotten where they come from. And Allah mentions in the Quran so often, Allah says, where did you come from? Don't you remember when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you from nothing? And so you were nothing and Allah made you something. So don't forget that everything that you have is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that Allah could make you nothing again. And now obviously that is complete nothingness to what you are today, but there is a scale there. Sometimes a person who made it, a person who became wealthy forgets the times that they were not wealthy. Sometimes a person who is healthy forgets when they came into contact with sickness themselves or a loved one became sick. Sometimes a person who was not so well-known uh, now is well-known and they forgot when they were not so well-known. It's so many different things, right? But the point is, is that a person is deceived by the blessings and they forget their vulnerable moments. And the worst manifestation of that is when they mistreat people who are in the same situation that they once were. And so, for example, when it comes to guidance, Allah says to the Prophet Sallallahu Allah mentions to the Prophet Sallallahu were you not an orphan and Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala took care of you were you not searching for guidance and Allah guided you were you not uh, poor and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enriched you. So what's the response, Ya Rasulullah? When you see an orphan, how are you going to act now? When you see someone who is looking for guidance, how are you going to treat that person who is looking for guidance? When you see someone who is poor, how are you going to treat that person? So, and of course, always, keep on saying, Alhamdulillah, and thanking Allah for the blessing that he has given to you, whatever blessing he has given to you. And so that's the worst manifestation of ingratitude is when you treat people who are in a similar situation to what you were in before with contempt and ignore them, even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala treated you with generosity and did not ignore you. And the opposite, of course, in terms of gratitude and prophetic is what we have in Surah Al-Buha, where the Prophet some response is told to respond in the best of ways. And certainly he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, did respond in the best of ways. Another benefit to take from this hadith is that, you know, the difference between the three conditions, the blind man uh, was different in that 
uh, the leper and the bald man were seeing everyone else. And what happens is that when you see the ni'mah of everyone else, then that's where envy can develop. That's where competition can develop. That's where you can start to feel uh, lesser of yourself because you're seeing the way everyone else has this blessing and then people are looking at you and you don't have that blessing. And so what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? To lower your sight, to lower your gaze from what? From the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed people to accumulate. And why are so many people unhappy when they're on social media and they see what everyone seems to have this best life and they seem to have so much glamour on TV and on computer screens and on my social media outlet. My friends seem to have so many great things. The problem is, is that you see all of their good or what they portray of good and none of their hardships. And for yourself, you only see your hardships and you don't see your blessings. So when you look at them, you only see their blessings and you don't see their hardships. When you look at yourself, you only see your hardships and you don't see your blessings. And so those two people were looking out to the world and the world was looking at them and they were suffering, you know, not just from their conditions, but poverty as well uh, was the, the primary condition of all three people. The third person, the man who was blind, did not see the world around him. Right. And so that is better for the heart that a person lowers their gaze from the world. SubhanAllah, this person in particular, uh, you know, was not able to see the world around him. And so when he was, he immediately recognized the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon him. Also, the attribution of the ni'mah to Allah, that Allah gave me my sight. When Allah mentions the disbeliever on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions women an dhikri fa inna lahu wanka. وَنَحْشُرُهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَعْمَى قَالَ رَبِّي لِمَا Subhanallah. Uh, he, so, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that on the day of judgment, those that turned away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's guidance, that they would, uh, that, that they would be raised up on the day of judgment blind. قَالَ رَبِّي لِمَا حَشَرْتَنِي أَعْمَى Sorry. So he says, my Lord, why did you resurrect me as blind? وَقَدْ كُنْتُ بَصِيرًا and I used to be able to see. SubhanAllah, this person on the day of judgment attributes their eyesight to themselves and attributes the taking away of the eyesight to Allah. Why did you make me blind and I used to be able to see? This is the opposite where this man says, Alhamdulillah, you, you know, Allah was the one who gave me eyesight. Without Allah giving me eyesight, I would have nothing. Also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that no person is tested with blindness, that I do not take away a person's eyesight, and then they are patient, except that that person will be rewarded with al-Jannah. And so Jannah still remains at the highest level for that person and is the highest reward. Finally, the fact that the, you know, the man was, did not just do what was asked of him, but the man showed ihsan, excellence. وَهَلْ جَزَاءُ الْإِحْسَانِ إِلَّا الْإِحْسَانِ And Allah does not reward excellence except with excellence. The man could have said, of course, take the one sheep that you asked for. But the Prophet ﷺ mentioned amongst those that are shaded by the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the right hand gives and the left hand doesn't even know. A person is just open and giving when they are called for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they trust that Allah was the source of that blessing in the first place and therefore they do not withhold it when they are called for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they know that the source of that good is infinite that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them more when they respond ta'ala. So may Allah make us amongst those that are grateful for our blessings. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the best of this life and the next and protect us from the punishment. Allahumma ameen. Jazakumullahu khayran. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. That was lessons upon lessons upon lessons in that uh, one story. Um, inshallah, we have a little bit of time now to uh, for have you guys, having you guys submit questions. I know there's a lot of questions that come through after every session. So you're welcome to take the next 10 minutes uh, to drop them into your chats on YouTube, on Facebook, and here on Faith Essentials, inshallah. And we'll take them for the next little bit. In the meantime, I have a quick question for you, Sheikh. Mashallah, I know you work a lot within many aspects of the Muslim community and expect externally to the community, working with relationships uh, with the non-Muslim uh, kind of world around us as well. But uh, I know kids are the future of that endeavor and those efforts in terms of building those relationships and in terms of having the confidence uh, to build up our faith in our ummah together. Um, what's important to you when it comes to hearing about a mother coming out with a kids program? Uh, what's the most exciting thing that comes to mind when it, uh, when it comes to that? And what do you want to see from the program itself uh, and how it benefits our children? I think that um, children are um, 
you know, it's so important that as Islamic institutions, we start creating content for children because uh, I think we underestimate how much our children love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how much they love the stories of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the companions. And so many times things that I did not make for children, still the children benefit more than the adults. And so I didn't necessarily make the firsts or the superstars or you know, beginning in the end, or, you know, I made inspiration, or at least I was a part of making this inspiration series for children. Um, but, you know, a lot of these things, the first, like, I wasn't thinking about it for children, but it seems like children are the ones that remember the most and that will come up to me and say, you know, I watched this and I listened to this and I benefited from this. So it's important for us to, uh, to cultivate that identity early on, that love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Islam, and to not underestimate our children. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa you know, used to talk to children like adults, right? Some of the most precious nasihas that he gave, advices that he gave to Abdullah bin Abbas and when he was a 10-year-old, right? And Anas bin Malik and Al-Hassan wal Hussein and these young, young Sahaba, right? Children uh, uh, have raised us as ummas, right? As an ummah. They have raised our generations, right? Those advices, those precious advices. So when I'm excited. I'm, I'm very pleased that Al-Maghrib, Alhamdulillah, uh, has taken on this endeavor. I hope that other organizations follow suit. I hope that this becomes a new, you know, a, a new, a new trend for us, inshallah ta'ala, to, uh, to really try to start to cater all of our content to children, inshallah ta'ala. And I'm happy to see that development, the development of that space. And alhamdulillah, Maghrib, of course, has just been an organization for so long that has always been there uh, to provide valuable lessons. Um, what am I most excited about? Let's see. Are any of the instructors going to be doing any juggling or anything like that? That would be hilarious. No, I think we, we purposely stayed away from from uh, putting the instructors in some tight spots because as we can see, our kids are very <laughs> pushy and, and they have very creative ideas in terms of what they want to see. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And someone just mentioned the angel series. My eight-year-old still remembers and implements the actions. How long may Allah right. bless that child and may Allah uh, allow that child to be guided and, and guide others always. I mean, I mean, and actually when I asked that question, Shay, I didn't get to read the answers, but most of the kids were like, oh, I watched the Angel series and they're pointing out specific videos, mashallah. So you're them. right. You I just mentioned them. that children will just exceed our expectations, even for the courses that we have at Al Maghrib that we've had for, you know, over a decade for adults. So many times I'll have a kids coming into the class or into courses that I'm like, how do you understand what's going on, mashallah? But they're just so eager. They need more information. They need stuff that's that's geared towards them because they're just see, like thirsty for it, mashallah. So I'm excited to see the launch of Al Group kids and of course to support it and to find out more please visit amalgroup.org slash kids but speaking of kids you guys have submitted a lot of questions mashallah in the last few minutes that you have had so i'm going to try to get through as uh, many of them as we can in the next few minutes and then inshallah we'll finish off for day three so let me find a question because they you guys are going crazy mashallah with emojis um Perfect. Um, the first question is what happened in the end did allah renounce the blessings that the le the leper the le <laughs> Sorry, the leper and the bald man had. I missed it. Um, well, it just mentions that Allah was displeased with them. And so they failed the test. The punishment is not mentioned, though. So I stopped it with the hadith stop. So everything else would be assumption. Perfect. The next comment actually is a, is a nice one is um, someone's not saying Jazakallah khair for this story. My mom is partially blind and I think she really needs to hear more stories that she can relate to about blind people or people with disabilities. So Jazakallah khair for picking this topic. Um, so another one, uh, another question is what form was the angel? Oh, it just jumped up and I lost it. But I'm assuming it was what form was the angel in when he visited the three men? Was he in angel form or human form? I can have like 10 seconds. I'm going to grab a cup of water. My throat's not saying <laughs> No problem, Shay. Go right ahead. You guys have been going crazy with the questions, so I'm going to try. Now, keep in mind, uh, the ones that are really, really specific, the Sheikh may not know the answers to the ones that are uh, particularly about the angel's characteristics or things like that, but feel free to go on ahead. And because there's much so many of you having so much interactions and emojis and, co and comments coming in through YouTube, don't forget to like the YouTube page, uh, the, the YouTube video, subscribe to the channel and turn on your notification bell so that you can, uh, you don't miss any of the future videos that we have coming up in this series. And even after that, and of course on Facebook, we also have the Family First Facebook group that you're welcome to join, mashallah. Um, all right, guys, calm down with emojis for just a little bit so that I can find your questions, inshallah. Um, let, me, let me go ahead and answer the question. So first yeah. and foremost, Malas Pranta, bless your mother and cure her and reward her and for her patience throughout this. Um, some of the, the, it's the hearts that are blind, not the eyes. This is something that 
I actually had a panel uh, for Muhsin on Sunday, Muslims Understanding and Helping with Special Education Needs, something I'm very passionate about. Uh, and I was mentioning that one of, one of the greatest scholars, a scholar that I have, you know, really, i looked to as like a, a role model in, in recent times, is Sheikh Abdul Hamid Kishk, rahimahullah, who was blind. Um, uh, an incredible human being whose heart was as alive as could be and could see uh, as, as much as any one of us could. So it's, it's the heart, it's not the eyes. Uh, and that's something that's very clear from this hadith. Secondly, was the man in angel form when he went to them in the, was the angel, sorry, in angel form when he went to them in the first place? Uh, probably not, uh, because that is something that even the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Jibreel Alayhi Salaam, used to come to him in the form of a man. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam only saw Jibreel Alayhi Salaam in his full form twice. And other than that, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would see a light and he would hear the voice of Jibreel Alayhi Salaam. So certainly when we talk about uh, average people, then uh, it would, you know, the assumption is that it would be a man coming to them, um, not the angel coming to them in, in the form of a man, as opposed to, um, you know, in their full angelic form. And we have a few people asking, do angels still come to us today? Can an angel come to me, for example, and, uh, and give me a lesson or speak to me in human form? So that's a video I have. You can go watch it. <laughs> but I'll give it that. It's, it's actually, it's one of the episodes of the Angel series. It's possible, very, very unlikely. And you shouldn't make that assumption. And the point, the whole point of the story is that it shouldn't matter if the person was an angel or not. The moral of the story was that they, sh that had they known it was an angel, they would have treated the person differently. So uh, it's very unlikely, um, but not impossible. Um, and there's a few questions also asking, when did this story take place? The Prophet Sallallahu mentions it from Bani Israel. So it's, that's a long span of history. It could be any time in Bani Israel. All right. Um, a question on Faith Essentials is, for those who give, how much should we give from our wealth? For example, I'm tempted to continuously donate and feel guilty when I don't donate at times. So how do we handle dealing with our wealth and charity and maintain a balance? So a person should not put themselves in poverty when they give. Like, so a person should not put themselves in debt or um, forego paying off debts because of charity. Other than that, generosity is always beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a hadith of a man who would give one third of his wealth and then one third he would reinvest and one third he would give to his family. Uh, and that uh, a man was walking, it's in Sahih Muslim, a man was walking and he heard a voice from the sky that said, water the garden of so-and-so. So he followed the cloud and he saw that it rained into a very particular funnel uh, or into a very particular uh, stream. And it, the stream perfectly formed to irrigate the garden of this man. The Prophet ﷺ says that the man then went to that garden and they said to him, you know, who are you? I heard a voice from the sky saying, irrigate the garden of so-and-so. I came to your garden. And I see, mashallah, the water came to you. And the man mentioned that I give one third of my wealth in charity, one third to my family, to take care of my family and my needs, and one third I reinvest into my business. So that's the, uh, an equation there. Um, but the reality is, is what the Prophet said, the most beloved of deeds are the ones that are consistent, even if they're small. So small, regular charity. Um, the spirit of Iman, when you hear someone calling upon you to give for the sake of Allah, and you don't think about it, you, you give and you don't sit there and, and make you know calculations to like, is this gonna inconvenience me? However, you don't put yourself in poverty uh, when you give. Next question is, Sheikh, what's your favorite angel? Jibreel alayhi salam. I have an absolute love of Jibreel alayhi salam. Um, and he is uh, the, the, the chief of the angels. And, um, you know, I, I taught a long seminar on Jibreel alayhi salam. I could, I could have taught. 10, 15, 20 hours on him. I mean, he, he's so fascinating to me um, because he has been there from the very beginning. He has accompanied all of the prophets of Allah and he still comes down. Laylatul Qadr, Tanazzalul Malaikatu, wa Ruhu Fiha. So the way that Allah loves him and praises him, the closeness that he had to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in particular, it's absolutely beautiful to me. So may Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala gather us with uh, the highest uh, prophets, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow when the angels come upon us and say salam in this life and the next, that Jibreel alayhi salam be amongst them. 
I mean, someone else is asking now, uh, can you see Jibreel Islam in a dream? Is that possible to see angels in dreams? It's not impossible, but again, it's hard. Um, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned that whoever, um, and, and you know, you, you, you would most likely be seeing something representative of Jibreel to some extent. Not because seeing Jibreel in his full form, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi again, only saw him twice um, in his full form. Uh, the reason why I say it's not impossible is, you know, there's nothing to su suggest that it's impossible in, in the hadith uh, to see something that would resemble Jibreel Alayhi Salaam. Maybe you would see Dihya, uh, who he would resemble in, in a dream, the man that he would resemble. Uh, or you would hear a voice or whatever it is. You, you can't receive revelation. You're not going to become a prophet. You, halal and haram can't change because you saw a dream and you thought you saw Jibreel Alayhi Salaam. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that shaitan cannot imitate the Prophet which indicates that dreams can be inconsistent and we should not rely upon them uh, too much. Um, only the Prophet we can be certain if, if a person saw the Prophet and matched the description perfectly that, uh, that, we, that we would be certain about it. Perfect. Uh, someone else is asking, uh, are you planning on doing any new talks or series on Jibreel Alayhi Salaam? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'll, I will say this then, inshallah ta'ala, um, I'm working on a, um, a few series right now, inshallah ta'ala. I've, I've been working on my Ramadan series since last Ramadan. Um, it's just been, it's been, and you'll see what it is, inshallah. So I'll just leave it there. That's but it's, it's, it's very special and near and dear to my heart. It's not about angels, um, but I hope inshallah ta'ala, it'll be, it'll be a, a major connection for people's iman. I'm also going to start working on another series, inshallah ta'ala, um, that I'm going to release over the next month, hopefully in January, inshallah, which is uh, for the family of those um, that have passed away because so many people are passing away. And so that'll involve some element of understanding the hereafter bit and how we remain connected to our loved ones when they pass away. Um, we'll stay tuned for that inshallah subhanallah. Ramadan is only about four months away, four months and change. It's yeah. speeding to us. Alhamdulillah. Okay, so I see a lot of questions, but they're repetitive. I think we've covered most of the basics of, of the story. So Jazakallah Khair Sheikh for coming uh, back with us and doing this exciting story time. I think this is probably the youngest audience that we've had live online, but they've been uh, super excited and we've had a lot of compliments, Sheikh. Apparently you have a very nice smile. So Jazakallah Khair, may Allah preserve you. Allah bless you. And bless all, right. all of the attendees and their families. I mean, I mean, all right, Sheikh, we'll let you go. It's been a pleasure to have you along with us uh, for the Family First series and in support of the amalgrip.org slash kids uh, campaign. And we look forward to seeing you again and all the exciting things that you have planned for the new year. Take care of yourself, stay safe. And for now, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa all righty. Awesome, guys. Thank you so much for your interaction. You guys, as, all, as always, are half the entertainment and the fun is to, to see your amazing comments and your interactions. Uh, make sure, once again, if you're coming in from Facebook to join the Family First Facebook group to stay tuned because there's so many more exciting things coming up after this series. Uh, and of course, on YouTube, like, comment, and subscribe, inshallah, to the channel so that you can find out more information and turn on that notification bell so you know next time we're going live. And of course, we have ourselves coming back tomorrow uh, for the continuation of the Family First series. That that will be day four out of our five total days. Friday is going to be the last day that we have, inshallah, with you all. Uh, but if you stay subscribed and you join our groups, inshallah, you'll find out next time we have something exciting coming your way. For tomorrow's sessions, we have two of my favorite shiuk coming in. One is going to be Sheikh Amar Shukri at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and he's going to be talking about the story of Isra wal Miraj, the story of the ascension of the Prophet. And then next, we have Sheikh Majid Mahmoud, again, an amazing storyteller uh, who's going to be speaking about the story of Maryam Anisaram. Jazakallah khair for joining us once again. Don't forget to check out the amazing things that are happening with amalgrib.org slash kids uh, and check out and support that campaign so that we can provide way more uh, super kid focused and exciting content for you all. Uh, and there's so many things that are uh, aspects of that project that we're so excited to bring to our younger audience. Thank you so much to those of you who are joining us for the third day in a row. And we look forward to seeing you for day four tomorrow at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Take care, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your evenings. Assalamu alaikum wa